guess what time it is? It's time for some more physics! Epic! Hello everybody, I'm Ferrar, and today we're going to be continuing where we left off in the 2017 FMA. Let's get into it. No more further ado, we're going to get started right away. Just kidding, we're not just going to get into it, okay? I don't like getting into things, just like I don't like combing my hair, but... First thing that I have to tell you, while making a Discord server, join at the link in the card in the description. And yeah, that's all I got to say. Sorry for the interruption, I'm a troll. Sorry. See ya. Let's do some ECMA. Alrighty, starting with number 7, so we got a train, originally a mass M, is traveling on a frictionless, straight, horizontal track with constant speed V. Snow starts to fall vertically and sticks to the train at a rate rho, where rho has a unit kilogram per second. The train's engine keeps the train moving at constant speed V as snow accumulates on the train. So it's asking what the rate at which the kinetic energy of the train and snow increases. Okay, so basically we know that the mass of the train is m plus rho t, right? It starts with m and then every second it gets rho more mass. And then we know that kinetic energy is just one half of this times v squared. So if we expand this out, we get one half m v squared plus uh, 1 half rho t v squared is equal to our kinetic energy and then basically we start off at 1 half mv squared as our kinetic energy, right? Then every t seconds, we're basically, okay, we okay we can rewrite the last term as plus 1 half rho v squared t. So you can see that we start with 1 half mv squared as our initial kinetic energy when t equals 0, but every second that we increase t by, so when t equals 1, t equals 2, t equals 3, we increase our kinetic energy by 1 half rho v squared. So that means that our answer is simply D. Epic! Alright, now it's asking us for the minimum power required by the engine to keep the train traveling at a constant speed v. So basically for number 8, we had to use the equation power is equal to force times velocity. And force is just the rate of change of momentum. So we know that our momentum is basically m plus uh, rho t times v, right? That's just our momentum. So that means the rate of change of our momentum is just rho v, right? So if our f is equal to rho v, then if we plug this into our first equation for power, we get power is equal to rho v times v is equal to rho v squared, so we get our answer is e. Epic. Very, very, very epic. Alrighty, number nine. You guys ready for this? Class A, B, and C each have a circular base with radius of two centimeters. An equal volume of water is poured into each flask and none overflow. Rank the force of water on the base of the flask from greatest to least. Okay, so the key thing to note here is that it's e equal volume, it's not an equal level. So if it was an equal level, all the force on the bottom would be the same, because of pressure. But this ain't equal volume. So if we look at it, A is going to be filled up to let's say here, right? But if we draw B right next to it, the base of B is exactly the same as the base of A. But it tapers outward, so that means that it's going to have more volume and less height. So an equal volume of water is only going to come up till here. And then for C, it has exactly the opposite case. Its, volume, its level of water is going to be all the way up here because it's like smaller volume. So since pressure depends like purely based on the height of the water, because like the equation is P equals P0 plus rho GH, and we have that F is equal to PA, we know that as height increases, our pressure increases, and since all our areas are the same, force is going to increase if pressure increases. So we know that C has the greatest height, so it's going to have the greatest force. We know that B has the lowest height, so it's going to have the lowest force. So which answer is that? That is just answer D. That is our answer. Alright, so a handle of gallon milk is plugged by a manufacturing defect, right? After removing the cap and pouring out some milk, the level of milk in the main part of the jug is lower than in the handle, as shown in the figure. Which of the statements is true of the gauge pressure P of the milk at the bottom of the jug? So let's like draw the diagram real quick and then we can check this boy out. So basically you know that this is like atmospheric pressure right here, right? Because it's connected directly to the atmosphere. This pressure over here, like behind the stopper, we have no idea what it is, so we don't know that. So basically you know that the pressure here is also equal to P0. So the pressure from like this line over here to this line over here has to increase from whatever pressure is here to P0. How does that help us though? Huh. So basically gauge pressure is not the absolute pressure. Gauge pressure is the pressure relative to the atmosphere. So if we know that this over here is P0, then we had to, all we had to do is go down to the bottom and find the pressure there relative to P0. So we know that our equation for pressure we used before is just P equals P0 plus rho GH, and in this case, this H over here is big H. 
so it's rho g8, and we know that gauge pressure is just relative to p0, so it's just rho g8, which is answer B. Alrighty, moving on. A small, hard, solid sphere of mass m, and the glitable radius is connected to a thin rod of length l and mass 2m. A second small, hard, solid sphere of mass m and the glitable radius is fired perpendicularly at the rod at a distance h above the sphere attached to the rod and sticks to it. Epic. Alright, so in order for the rod not to rotate after the collision, the second sphere should hit the thin rod F. So is the thin rod attached anywhere? So no, this is like a, this is like on a table. So it's, if it's on a table, it should have no gravity, you don't have to worry about that. Well basically for it not to rotate, it can't have any angular momentum before or after the collision around its center of mass. So basically, if it's not going to have any angular momentum around the center of mass, the velocity of this new ball has to go literally through the center of mass of the rod. So basically the problem is just asking us to find the center of mass of this rod over here. So the rod itself has length L and mass 2M, but the sphere that's added on the end of this rod is uh, mass M. So basically if you have two objects like added together, the strategy for finding the center of mass is to take the two individual center of masses and then find the center of mass of those two individual center of masses. So we know that the center of mass of a rod is just in the middle, and then the center of mass of a point is just the point itself. So we have a 2m point here and an m point there. So this problem just reduces to finding the uh, center of mass of these two points. And basically the uh, logic is that if you have a center of mass, and the top one is x and the top one is bottom one is y, then we know that x to y is equal to m to 2m. So we know that our 2m center of mass is halfway along the rod, right? So that corresponds to h is equal to l over 2. So for x, y to be 1 to 2, x is going to have to be l over 6 and y is going to have to be l over 3. And basically our answer is just y because we're trying to find the height of the center of mass and that's just y. Epic. So the answer is just B, 11B, noise. Okay, number 12. In order for the rod to not to rotate after the collision, the second sphere should have a mass m given by. So this is the same logic. As long as it hits the center of mass of the rod, then any mass will work. It doesn't matter because the formula for angular momentum is mvr. So if our r is zero, then our thing is gonna be zero regardless of what our mass is. So we should be Gucci with E. We're zooming through these problems, it's pretty epic. Okay, 13, a massless rope passes over a frictionless pulley. Particles of mass m and m plus one are suspended from the two different ends of the rope. If m equals zero, the tension t in the pulley rope is mg. In instead, the value of m increases to infinity, the value of the tension blank. Okay, wait, huh? Was the tension not increased to infinity? Wait. Wait, so if m goes to infinity, it's basically like making one mass infinite. Huh. Alright, let, let us do some equationifying. So we basically have our pulley, we got our mass m, and we got our mass m plus m. So the idea behind pulley problems is you basically set both the masses to have acceleration a. And then you do free body diagrams on each of the masses. So the only forces we're working on the left mass are t and capital mg. On the other one, it's just t and downward m plus mg. So for the left one, if we say that the blocks are accelerating such that the right one is going down, then we could say that t minus mg is equal to capital MA, and then for the second one we have m plus mg minus t is equal to m plus MA. So basically we're trying to solve for the tension in the rope, right? So if we want to solve for the tension, we got to get rid of A because that's our only other unknown, and we don't care about the A, we only care about tension, so let's get rid of that. We can just do that by dividing. Let me get rid of this diagram, we don't need it anymore. So basically you get T minus MG over M plus MG minus T is equal to M over M plus M. Now if we multiply the denominator, we get T minus MG is equal to MG minus M over M plus MT. And then if we solve for T, we just get T is equal to 2M times m plus m over 2 capital M plus m. Now since m is in both the numerator and the denominator, it basically, as it goes to infinity, it's going to approach a constant. Because both the numerator and the denominator increase at the same rate. Wait, whoops, I forgot a g, but there, that's, that's what our tension is. But does it increase or decrease is the question. So it's either b or d, right? Because we know that it changes 
and we know that it changes to a finite constant. So basically a trick to uh, dealing with things that approach infinity is you basically take the ratio of the coefficients of the variable that's going to infinity. So expanding this out, we basically have the 2m squared plus 2mm over 2m plus m. And if we take the ratio of the um, lowercase m, the coefficients of that, you basically have 2m over 1, and you get that the answer of what it goes to as it goes to infinity is 2mg. Another way to think of it is as m goes, it gets really big, this 2m squared term and this 2m, these are both constants, so they don't even matter anymore. So we could just do 2mm over m, which is just 2m, and then multiply that by g and get this. According to this, m is equal to 0, it starts at mg, right? So it increases to 2mg, so our answer got to be d. All right, let us go through one more. Let's see, there, oh, it's a multiple part one. Hold up. All right, I think that's enough for today. Let us check our answers and hope we did well. I mean, that would be kind of sad if we didn't. We got this, okay, I believe. Do you believe in me? You better believe in me, okay? Otherwise, I'd be very sad. Like, like I'd really start crying, okay? Come on. All right, so seven, D, epic. Eight, E, okay, very epic. Nine, D, okay, epic. 10, B, <gasps> 11, B, 12, E, 13, D, let's go, very nice. How much for how much? Wait, 13 minus 7 plus 1 is 7. 7 for 7. F. That's what I call a very productive physics session. Alrighty, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you guys for watching. As always, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like and subscribe for more. Let me know down in the comments if there's any suggestions for videos you guys want. I've seen all your suggestions. There's so many that I have to go through still. I will make them happen, okay? Don't worry. It's happening. Once again, thank you guys so much for watching, and see you guys next time.